So um, we're here talking about uh, creating self-regulated learners, strategies to strengthen students' self-awareness and learning skills by Linda B. Nilsson. I will send out a link at the end of this workshop with a link to, uh, or an email at the end of the workshop with a link to the uh, book in the library. So you can access this on your own if you want to uh, peruse the chapters and uh, suggestions. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about what Nelson is talking about as far as like what self-regulated learners are um, and what we can do to build in this, uh, the process of uh, self-regulation into our courses to help students build those skills on their own. And uh, then they can hopefully take that into uh, the world beyond, whether it's actually the classroom or just learning things on their own um, and recognizing that the learning process applies to so many other places, uh, not just in places where you're getting formal grades. Um, again, I am Dr. Lindsay Reeland. Y'all can call me Lindsay and my pronouns are she, her. And I am an inclusive teaching coordinator for the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning here at NIU. So in this workshop, oh, I'm going to turn my little video off. Um, in this workshop, we're going to develop an understanding of what self-regulated learning is. We're going to uh, look at the impact of self-regulated learning on student success. And then we're going to also talk about activities that can support self-regulated learning that we can do in the classroom. Um, but we can also encourage students to do uh, outside of the classroom as part of their studying, as part of their uh, reflection after getting um, feedback on an assignment or after an exam or whatever that looks like. So uh, as I said, we're talking specifically about uh, Nelson's Creating Self-Regulated Learners. There are other resources on self-regulated learners out there. Um, I'm going to be focusing on what Nelson says, though. Uh, but know that there are, uh, this is a very short book, by the way. Um, but there are other resources that exist uh, in spaces that are going to be, you know, a 30 page read versus a 120 page read. So to start off, um, what is self-regulated learning? So uh, we're hopefully moving towards self-regulated learning with our students and with ourselves too. Um, and Nelson says that it is a total engagement activity involving multiple parts of the brain. Uh, it's not related to measured intelligence and anybody can develop it. So uh, this does not reflect um, someone's IQ or GPA necessarily. Um, it doesn't reflect whether or not they are particularly skilled in a specific area. Um, it, is about what they do with the information presented to them that they are expected to learn and what does that learning process look like in order for them to work on those skills in order for them to remember the information um, so the key components that nelson identifies are self-observation self-evaluation motivation and perseverance um, and uh, Marissa, you already mentioned this idea of students reflecting on their learning. And so that's where that self-observation and that self-evaluation really comes into play. Students thinking about, okay, what have I done to learn? Has this been successful? What do I need to do to uh, shift that? And the process is not intuitive. So students, um, I should say, learners in general, people in general, often need to have this process explained and modeled for them. Some of us might find it intuitive to think about 
um, the ways that we've learned and think recognize like, oh, there's a pattern here. This is what is uh, necessary in order for me to focus on this thing. And this is how I was able to achieve this, whatever. Um, but in the K through 12 setting, a lot of students aren't being asked to reflect on their learning process. Uh, they come into the college classroom and they say, I'm this type of a learner. And they don't really know what that means. They'll say, oh, well, I need hands-on learning or, oh, I need visual representation. Um, and that involves specifically what is happening in the class. They don't think about what needs to happen outside of the class uh, or what they need to do with what happens inside of the class too. Um, so this is a cycle, essentially. Um, students need to set a plan. They need to uh, figure out what they're going to be doing. They need to monitor themselves. They need to reflect on it. And then they need to go back and re like go through the cycle again and think about uh, what their new plan is going to be how uh, how are they performing, what's going on with that, and reflect. And so it can seem really, really overwhelming and a really tedious process. Um, but once people start to do this, it doesn't have to be like a formal plan. It doesn't have to be uh, formally laying out strategies. It can be, you know, time to yourself reflecting on what's happening um, and thinking about, okay, what are my goals coming up for this week when I'm focusing on physics? or what are my goals coming up for um, the second half of the semester? Once we get past this exam, how am I going to achieve the things that I need to achieve in this class to hopefully get the grade or to you know, keep the scholarship or whatever that looks like? So um, as I mentioned, the self-regulated learning um, is, is something that applies outside of our formal classrooms too. So there's a lot of career readiness skills that students will pick up on, but it's also just like good for hobbies and uh, life in general. So we're going to acquire skills for project management, for self-esteem, for resiliency, um, develop self-discipline, perseverance, and determination, uh, which are obviously all great when you're at a job site or learning specific things about, you know, I don't know, physics is just apparently on my mind, so we'll say physics again. But um, also developing self-discipline, perseverance, and determination is good when you are learning how to train your dog, right? These are skills that we can take with us into other spaces too when you're learning how to uh, drive stick. Um, these are these are things that we uh, we would love to have in order to be successful in other spaces. Um, you also learn how to manage stress and behavior um, because this process looks at our mistakes and our challenges and does something with that. Um, so many students are so afraid to make mistakes. They're so afraid of failure. Um, and that's linked to the grading system too. So that's maybe something that uh, is a conversation to uh, also have when we're thinking about self-regulated learning and we're thinking about how to support students. Um, but uh, it's really easy to become um, upset when you're not doing well and to uh, disengage from what's happening instead of taking that as an opportunity to uh, reflect on what's happening with your um, with the way that you're trying to learn or the way that you're trying to uh, to achieve your goals. Bill, there's a little bit of background noise on your end. Do you mind muting yourself? No, no, no problem at all. Thank you. Um, and this really gives us an opportunity to become a lifelong learner and to teach others to become lifelong learners. Um, so again, if you're working, you know, at, uh, it could be a job, it could be what you're doing with your community, it could be a personal interest, 
and these skills will still apply to these other spaces. And it applies to us as educators too. Um, these are things that we can model for our students and we can recognize that they are important um, even if you're not getting a formal education in whatever you're applying these uh, this learning technique to. So the three um, main strategies uh, that Nelson talks about are uh, incorporating reflective practices, incorporating metacognitive techniques, and self-assessment tools. So uh, first, talking about reflection. So uh, some of us have classes where it's easier to incorporate reflection in like a very straightforward way. When I teach first year composition, it's easy for me to uh, assign a paper where students do a reflection on the um, on their research project. OK, so what did you do? How did you do it? What were your challenges? Um, but it may not seem as straightforward to incorporate it into other sort of courses uh, or other sort of skills. Uh, but reflection can happen through writing, which could be formal or informal. Um, could be ha could happen in discussions that students are having with each other or uh, full class discussions. They could be writing up. Uh, or developing, excuse me, concept maps or other sort of visual learning tools uh, with others or by themselves to think about their learning process um, and to think about what they've learned, why that's important, what were the pitfalls. Um, they can have reflections after assignments or after they learn new things. So uh, sometimes people will call it like a reading journal or something, but it could also just be uh, a reading reflection and having students like think about uh, what they're learning, how do they understand that, what are they applying this information to, how do they think they could log that information and really use those skills or um, that knowledge in the future uh, and, and have these this sort of reflective moment as they're getting tidbits of information, not necessarily just like a big reflection um, after a larger project. Um, and students can reflect on their own or reflect with others. Um, they can think about the ways that they prepare for schoolwork or working on projects and um, then use that information specifically to come up with a plan. So that's, you know, part of this cycle with uh, self-regulated learners is coming up with a plan of how they're going to uh, approach specific topics in the future, how they're going to approach their, uh, their schoolwork. And so that's where this reflection really helps uh, students come up with that plan. Like, okay, I didn't really fully understand this or um, I didn't uh, end up having enough time to go to the writing center, and I really wanted to do that. So this is what I need to do in order to make sure that that works for me in the future, because I didn't get the grade that I wanted because of that, or um, I knew I could have improved this, but I just needed that assistance. Supporting metacognition. Um, Hopefully, we're thinking about thinking, um, but uh, or, you know, as as the educator, we're thinking about thinking. Right. Um, but students not, aren't necessarily thinking about thinking and how they are logging the information away in class. Um, a lot of what students do is short term learning versus long term learning. And so it might be memorizing something for a short period of time, um, you know, regurgitating that on the exam and then walking away from the class and having a blank space in their mind where all that information was. Um, so we should be encouraging students to be self-aware, uh, thinking about what they've learned, how they learned it, why does it matter? Um, whether they remember the exact formula or the exact um, 
passage from Shakespeare that you were asking them to remember. All the words maybe doesn't matter, but why is that important? How does this fit into this larger theme of, of the course? How does this fit into their major? How does this fit into their world? Um, that's really beneficial. Um, so metacognition can happen through goal setting exercises, coming up with time management plans, and through that reflection as we talked about earlier. So actually coming up with plans, thinking about uh, how am I going to spend the time that I need to spend on this class? Um, how much time do I need to think about these things? Um, what's the ideal space for that to happen? And, and a lot of us do encourage our students to think about where are they going to do their homework? Do you have a quiet space to do that? Do you need to rent out a space in the library? Um, is your uh, roommate loud? Um, are you doing work in the hallways between classes because you have so many classes on your um, on Mondays and Wednesdays? Is that a, an environment that is comfortable or that you can you know do that easily? Um, so some of us are already doing that first step and asking students to think about their needs as a learner. Um, but this is asking us to sort of like have them formalize that and really think critically about that and be self-aware that, you know, okay, I'm falling into these patterns. This isn't necessarily a great thing for me. I need to step out and do this thing instead. Um, and so students, again, like after readings or being introduced to other sort of content, um, music, audio, uh, YouTube videos, whatever it is, um, you can use in-class discussions with open-ended questions, um, have students think a little bit more um, about the information that is being presented to them as opposed to a lecture where you might just be telling them about the information, right? Um, and having them make the connections to uh, how does this fit into the course? Uh, what does this change your mind about? How does this impact the way that you're seeing things? Um, do you understand this? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. So not only thinking about the content, but about its purpose, about its place, and about how it's impacting them as individuals. And some of these class or some of this uh, might seem a little bit more straightforward, uh, depending on you know what type of classes you're, you're uh, teaching. But there's still these opportunities for, you know, once a unit, once every six weeks, four weeks, whatever, to have students sort of sit down and think about how are they approaching the class? What are they doing? Um, and is it working for them? And that might be a one-on-one -on -one conference. That might be them just writing up something um, in class, giving them the time to do that in class uh, and having it sort of like a low stakes thing. It might be assigning that as homework um, and you know, giving them a point to do it. But uh, really encouraging them to sit down and think about, about themselves as learners uh, can be very, very useful. And the third part of thinking about themselves as learners is thinking about self-assessment. Um, and we, uh, might already be doing this at like the beginning and the end of the course, um, thinking about what are you coming into class knowing? What are the skill sets that you have? Uh, what are the things that you uh, already think you, you do well? And what are things that you want to work on further? Um, this happens a lot in the writing classroom. Students come in and, um, they think they know what they need to work on and sometimes they don't necessarily um, completely understand that. I mean, if you've ever worked with students that are doing 
uh, writing intensive work or if you've ever worked in like a writing center or whatever, students will often come in and say they need, that they need help with their grammar. Um, and grammar isn't really the um, most pressing issue for a lot of students. Um, they just know something is off and that's the word that comes to mind. So uh, having students step back and think a little bit more critically about um, what's going on. Okay, you think grammar is something that you don't do that well. Um, what does that look like for you? What are some of these uh, occurrences that you can uh, draw on and tell me about in order for me to help you and for you to help yourself? Um, and the self-assessment could be something that you come up with a rubric for. Um, it's easy to use a rubric that you are going to be using for an assignment already and give it to your students um, as they're working on their assignment and have them fill that out and sort of assess what they think they should um, be earning on the, on the assignment have them fill out examples of what they think they're doing well or um, what they perceive their issues to be. Um, and then that can become a conversation. Um, but you can also do uh, some short answer writing uh, where you give them specific categories, thinking about the skills that you want them to focus on in the class. Um, and if there is uh, if there's group discussions or resource library um, that are available to students after they do that assessment so that they have uh, tools at their fingers that they can work on the things that they need to work on easily once they identify, okay, this is this is a pitfall for me, um, that's, that's really, really useful. Um, if you're having students do self-assessment in class and it comes up with that, you know, 99% of them identified this one skill that you're especially trying to work on in class as a problem, that gives you an opportunity to then reflect, sit down and think about how you can support them if you need to take time and um, go over that again, hold specific office hours to focus on that. Um, if you need to do recorded uh, lecture to focus on that again, because maybe you don't have necessarily time to slow down in the class. Um, you can use that information to help them, but it also uh, gives them an opportunity to recognize that there's something more than them just not understanding it, um, which is often, you know, something that, that students do. It's just, I don't get it and they disengage from that information because they don't understand why they don't get it. Um, or they're not really uh, willing to take the time or maybe not willing, but like uh, don't have the time in this space to sit back and think about what they're doing and look at the forest, not just the tree. So obviously it would be amazing if everybody was a self-regulated learner and that we could just give them a textbook and some assignments and have them go along their merry little way and figure it out. Um, we know that that's not easy and we know that self-regulated learning is in and of itself is just not enough. Um, it's great if you can go off and do that, but um, students really benefit from learning communities. Um, so talking with other people, sharing their experiences, sharing suggestions, um, that's all really, really useful when we are learning. Um, and we find that to be true with everything. Uh, if you are somebody who, uh, you know, got into sourdough baking over uh, the pandemic, there are so many spaces for you to connect with other people that are doing the same thing and talk about um, 
what are your techniques? Uh, are you using this thing? What what temperature is your oven at? How do I check this? What, what should my starter look like? Is this too sticky? Is this too weird ever? So um, we find this in other spaces informally in our lives, but we need to make sure that we're recognizing that community and conversations about learning um, are really useful in all spaces. And maybe that happens with you um, as an educator too. Uh, having, if it's an online asynchronous class, you know, having a discussion board is great. Um, but maybe you're initiating a lot of those conversations or making yourself like easily available to have those conversations with students and recognize what's going on and uh, hear them out, as well as giving them suggestions on um, what they could do to uh, um, work on that thing or get over that hump. Um, another thing that is uh, sometimes a challenge when it comes to self-regulated learning is that mistakes are a big part of learning um, how to become self-regulated and learning your learning process. And um, not all of our classes are built in a way that allows students to make mistakes and still be successful in the class. So we have to build in some sort of safety net um, so that students, if they are making mistakes, if they are um, not successful their first time through, that they get opportunities to make up those points, to correct those mistakes, and to actually learn that material, not just move on, um, and think about their approach to learning in a different way. Um, instead of saying, well, I'm not good at that thing, great, that was a terrible unit. Now let's learn this other thing instead. Um, some of us have classes where our skills build over time, right? So um, again, uh, in the writing classroom, we might be talking about um, audiences one week and we might be talking about, you know, developing research and whatever, but we're working towards like this larger goal of, um, the research paper uh, versus um, uh, like a personal narrative. Um, so while we aren't necessarily using all the same skills in uh, both assignments, we're working on things like thesis statement. We're working on things like um, audiences and self-awareness and, and language and whatnot that we're going to be using um, regardless of the specific assignment uh, versus when I'm teaching um, a gender studies class, we might not be building as much. We might be focusing on uh, race and gender in one specific section. We might be looking at gender and pop culture in another section, which, you know, there's obviously going to be some overlap, but it's not necessarily um, building off of these skills. And so if somebody has an opportunity that they just uh, really, you know, miss the mark in the first four weeks of classes um, and they get, you know, a low grade, if they don't get an opportunity to go back and uh, work on that, that can impact their overall grade, obviously. But it also doesn't uh, allow them to look at learning as a process. And it doesn't give them the opportunity to pick up those skills that we said were important enough to give them a grade about in the first place. So um, building in opportunities for students to revisit work, uh, for students to get feedback on work before they submit it, um, to even give them a chance to retake an exam um, and work on the things that they missed to demonstrate that they uh, can do those tasks, that they can learn that information. You know, we have to build that into the class. That takes time. It takes time to slow down, to let students go back and to not just move forward. Um, and it takes us thinking differently about grading as well. And that can be really hard. 
So, um, I, based off of what uh, Nilsson talks about in the book, um, there are some questions that can encourage self-awareness and learners um, and are things that you can model in class and to think about uh, in large group, but also individually and to, you know, ask yourself also as you're moving along in the course and thinking about learning. Um, so, for instance, do I think about what I really need to learn before I get, begin the task? Um, do I change strategies when I fail to understand? Uh, how do you take notes? So do you, I jot down things I know might help me um, before attempting a solution? Um, am I aware of the strategies that I use when I study? Do I know what helped or hindered my understanding? And is this material connecting with or breaking away from uh, prior knowledge? So giving students an opportunity to uh, be reflective, uh, to be uh, using that metacognition um, and to be self-aware. Uh, we can all do that through incorporating class or incorporating questions into class. Again, this might be um, something that they take home and that they do on their own uh, and they submit it through Blackboard and they just get, you know, two points out of the 100 points for the semester um, or a thousand points for the semester, excuse me, uh, for submitting something um, and you encourage them to do this self-reflection outside of class. Could be an in-class discussion, could be an in-class activity. Um, this might look a little bit different depending on what you're trying to accomplish in class. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. No, I'm, uh, oh, wow, it turned on again. I wasn't going to say anything at all. I didn't do anything. Okay. I'll, I'll cut the noise for you again there. Or, oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. I just thought it popped on. I didn't hear any noise from you. And I was like, oh, Bill's got something. Bill's got some insight um is doing something well um but um that brings me to this opportunity for you to turn on your mics and uh share experiences or ask questions or um share suggestions as well um so i'm curious what are some of the ways that you've encouraged self-regulated learning Maybe you haven't been doing that necessarily intentionally. Um, maybe you have just been sort of um, like in your uh, case, Marissa, working with first year students, um, just trying to get them to think about success and thinking about learning in different ways. Maybe you already incorporated some of those uh, aspects of self-regulation. Um, I'm also curious if there are some challenges that you've encountered uh, when you're trying to support students um, and thinking about self-regulation when it comes to learning um, or, you know, just reflection or med metacognition or self-awareness in general. Um, and if you have any questions. Well, what I, I can speak pretty quickly. Uh, just almost everything we do in music is self-regulated, I have to say. Yes. So you, yep. we have to practice and then we have to teach ourselves from what we hear in our practicing, the piano or whatever it might be. And uh, we also make recordings constantly of what we've done, then we sit back and listen to it, we make notes on it, then we go and try something else. And so all that fits into the, this category very well, I would say. And we also do things in groups, as you mentioned, um, the, the, we perform for each other re regularly um and hear comments from the other listeners who, who have other opinions so about what what would improve things so i think a lot of it is uh fits into the categories you're mentioning very well oh for sure and i i wonder too um and this isn't necessarily something that you would be able to answer but since it's so intuitive in in your um 
in your field, I'm wondering too, if students, uh, after, you know, years and years of doing that, right? Cause it's not like you're just, uh, deciding to fiddle with music randomly. Um, uh, the first time, you know, your first day on campus or whatever, but I'm wondering if they're taking those skills and using them in other spaces. Um, Cause you know, we see that students, especially when they um, feel supported by a community and are able to learn with community um, that they seek out community in other spaces too. So um, I love that they're, you know, that that's such a, um, what do I want to say? It's, it's so intuitive and that you're supporting that so much in that space. Um, and I'm sure that students are just benefiting from that so much because yeah, it sh they shouldn't be learning alone in those situations. Um, and, you know, obviously some people do, uh, but yeah, I love that. That's so great. Yeah. Well, it's good to, it's good to learn alone and get your own ideas that come to you, whether intuitively, it's not only intuitive. I mean, I do give them a what what amounts to a rubric that is different categories yeah. of things that they can. The, I always tell them to when they're teaching themselves and when they're practicing. So it was the rhythm correct? Was the um, phrasing correct? Was the dynamics how loud you were playing in different sections correct? You know, or the way you want it. I shouldn't say correct because music's very subjective, but. Still, sure. uh, I do give them a rubric, which is a long list of items to consider if they, uh, and I tell them that it's it's useful for themselves, for teaching themselves and working on their performance, but also if they're, they, most all of them are going to end up teaching somebody sometime in their life also. So you can use it mm -hmm. at, at lessons too. So, and they do things in community. I always also tell them that even if they decide they hate music and they want to drop out and go do something else, uh, the music brings people together to in community, like you were saying, that uh, uh, where everybody uh, has input into what everybody else does, and we we learn from other people's ideas. So that applies to almost anything you do, <laughs> any any kind yeah. of job you may have in the future. Working together with other people is real important. Yeah. Um, no, I love that, Bill. You, I, clearly you've been so intentional about how you're building that into the class, um, which is just so impressive. I know it's not your first year teaching, so I know these are things that you've been building over time. No, no, no. Um, I'm about but, to be uh, <laughs> <laughs> but clearly you've been uh, building and building these things and being so intentional. And that's uh, so great, especially like you said, you know, like you're teaching people that are going to teach whether formally or informally and giving them the skills and bringing that awareness to them that like, oh, hey, you can do these things on your own too. Um, that's so great. Thank you for sharing. Marissa, did you have something that you wanted to share? I think I saw your mic go on. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, so I, it's been a while since I've, I've taught a first year seminar. So this will this fall will be I'll be back in the classroom with that but I think about I see this in my advising role a lot and I, I see how I can you know bring it into the classroom but so often students um, when I'm meeting with them for advising talk about their academic challenges and often um, I hear well you know the professor's teaching style just doesn't work for me uh, right and it's very like it's about what someone else is doing and not about what my role as the student is. Um, and yeah. so I think that that's, that's an area where I try to, you know, take a step back and talk with them about like, okay, so it, that's, that, that may be true, right? Like, but like yep, not everyone is going to teach in ways that maybe are best for you, but that might not change, right? Like your professor is probably not going to change how they're teaching the course. So what role do you have? What can you change about your experience to get the type of, you know, learning that you need? Um, and so I think it's, you know, a lot of posing that question back to the student, which I don't think they're very familiar, you know, that's, that's not something they're used to. <laughs> I think they're yeah. often, you know, um, used to hearing, oh, okay, great that person isn't isn't 
you know, teaching in the way that you want. So just don't take another class with them or, or um, they haven't often been, been pushed to take that step back and reflect and, and alternately just on a, um, not even, you know, when a professor, when they, when they say a professor isn't teaching um, to the way that they, you know, best learn, but if just they're not getting the grades that they want, they often think, well, I don't have, I don't have more time. I, I put so much time in, right? And that's, I think you, you talked about that in the beginning about how um, sometimes that's sort of the go-to of like, okay, well, if this isn't working, then I just need to put in more time. And maybe that is true for some things, maybe more time is the answer. But I think also taking that step back with students and considering maybe more time isn't necessarily the answer, but maybe it's the strategies in which you're using with your time, right? And so, um, reminding students that learning is not a one size fits all experience. Um, you know, that what they're doing and what their friends are doing might not line up or what they're doing for one class might not work for another class. Yeah. Um, it is just another important piece of it. So I'm thinking about all of these things and how I can, you know, incorporate that reflection into my classes. So thank you for this um, presentation. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that you're bringing up this idea of um, how are we using the time that we have, right? Um, but also like awareness that um, learning different topics is you might not be approaching it the same way, and that's normal. Um, and I think students aren't necessarily aware of that. I think that many learners in general aren't necessarily aware of that. Um, and we have to be proactive rather than reactive with our with our learning um, experiences. So yeah, like you might not be able to get into another um, history class this semester and you need to take this class in order to do X, Y, Z things that you need to do next semester. Okay, so this person isn't teaching in a way that you prefer um, what can we do about that? Do we, uh, or we don't like the book. The book is dry. It's hard to read. Um, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, it's making reference to all of these things that I don't have the context for. So how do we, um, approach that in a way that, uh, we can, you know, still be successful, um, but maybe is supplementing some of that information and, and we have to do that on our own. Um, and so creating that plan, doing that self-reflection is really necessary um, in order to be successful. I mean, there's also going to be some students that um, care about one class more than another class. And so uh, we obviously always have to, you know, make space for that and know that, okay, they're only going to spend an hour, you know, preparing for this exam. They're happy with, you know, a D in this class uh, versus the A that they want to get in the other class. Um, so their uh, plans might look different for learning for those different classes just because of that. Um, but yeah, this takes a lot of, of uh, space for students to just step back um, for learners, I should say, in general, just to just step back and be like, okay, um, what is working? What isn't working? And am I being honest with myself about how I'm approaching these things? Am I looking at other people as, as the problem, which, you know, sometimes other people are the problem, but what are we doing with that? Um, in order to make sure that if you have to meet this goal, and this goal seems unachievable, what are you doing in order to uh, uh, step up to the plate? Um, yeah, no, I'm so glad that you're seeing this uh, as a tool too for the students that you're advising, Marissa, because I can only imagine how, uh, how dejected some students are probably coming into advising feeling, especially when they're coming in, you know, uh, halfway or three quarters through a semester and they're thinking, well, I might have to retake this thing or 
um, you know, are a couple weeks into the semester and they're trying to get out of a class because um, they don't like what's happening in the first weeks of the classes that they're taking. Um, yeah, thank you both so much for sharing. I really, really appreciate that. Um, clearly you have so much like insight and uh, experiences in these spaces that, you know, I don't. Um, but there's this commonality between, you know, just sort of trying to get these students to be like successful, but also, you know, like, let's, let's work on this thing together. You're not, you know, like you uh, kind of self-regulated -re learner, but you're not an island. There's still people that are going to support you and, and help you um, through this process. Lindsay, I was wondering with um, as far as like uh, offering opportunity for revision on assignments or exams in the classroom, are there uh -huh. any um, ways that that you have or you've seen a required reflective component to that? Right. So, like, if if we offer an opportunity to revise an assignment, um, would would part of this be it, would an important piece be not just offering the revision of the assignment, but in requiring like including some sort of reflective component to it? Yes, yes, that is very, very useful. Um, and generally, um, I would say probably like a paragraph would be enough for students. Some people actually will be like, okay, you chose to uh, change 15 things, you know, write a sentence at least about all the things that you changed. Um, but having students write, uh, you know, some sort of paragraph that accompanies the things that they changed um, is really useful. Uh, if, if it's a, a paper or a larger project, they might, you know, specifically highlight the things that they changed. Um, so that it makes it easier for you too um, when you're going and regrading something. Um, when you're looking back on, you know, what things that they uh, have have changed, because obviously grading things twice takes a lot of time. So uh, that, you know, lessens that burden, I think, for those of us that are grading too. But having them write a, a, a paragraph about, like, what did they change? Why did they change it? Um, what obstacle do they think got in the way from them doing it uh, like better the first time. And some of them might just say like, I ran out of time um, or I didn't realize that that was a big component when I was looking over the assignment or the rubric or whatever, but giving them an opportunity to be self-aware um, and have that reflection is, is very useful for you. Um, also to be like, oh wait, a bunch of students had to redo this thing. Like maybe there's, you know, like a self-reflection that needs to happen uh, with the educator as well, but it's a great opportunity to bake in that self-reflection for students to not just see, oh, I made this mistake, I'm gonna fix it, but okay, I made this mistake. Where did that come from? Um, how do I fix it? You know, what what do I need to do in order to not make that mistake again in the future? Um, so yeah, I I love a a reflective moment with the option to you know revise and resubmit or redo work. Um, I think it's, it's super useful and, um, encourages students to, to start that self regulation and, um, whether they're actively thinking about it that way or not. Um, okay. We are coming up on 11. I just want to thank you all for, uh, thank you both. I should say for, for, coming out um, on a Friday morning and um, and joining me here. Um, I will be sending out an email that has the uh, resources and this recording attached to it um, within an hour or so, so that you all uh, can take this with you and uh, think about it a little bit more. But please feel free if you have more questions or concerns um, to reach out to me and and ask them. We can talk one-on-one, -on -one, we can email, whatever works best for you. But yeah, just thank you so much for um, coming out this morning. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all the 
thoughtful conversations that we have too. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too.